The purpose of this video is to help build a bridge with which people who want to learn how to make transpilers can begin the process. This video will not explain in detail how transpilers work from a technical standpoint, nor will I cover the use of every IL opcode. This video will assume the following. You are capable of reading and debugging your own code. You are capable of using resources to teach yourself things you do not already know. The most common questions I receive about transpilers are generally related to I don't understand why X thing is done in this transpiler. And this video is mostly meant to fill in the gaps so people may continue to teach themselves how to work with transpilers. This video will be specifically focusing on making transpilers for events in the Exiled SCPSL plugin framework. And most of the answers and information within will be specifically in relation to those patches. While some of this information can be carried over to other uses, this is not an all-inclusive guide to patching with Harmony. We will want to start off with the basic, most common question I have received about transpilers. Why? There are many reasons to use transpilers in place of prefixes and postfixes, but the main reasons we use them are. They are easier to maintain. If you are using a prefix patch to override the code in a big method, and there are changes to that method due to an update of the original program. Even if those changes do not affect the code you are adding or changing, you must now find the changes that were made and duplicate them in your prefix, or worse, start from scratch. This can be a real pain, especially on very large methods that are present in some games. Transpilers, on the other hand, generally don't care if changes are made to a method. So long as the location of your patch within the method stays the same, changes will not be needed. And even if you do need to adjust the location of your code within the method, this is done quite easily and does not require you to reduplicate code from the method or rewrite your own code in most cases. They are efficient. If you have a very big method to patch and you are only adding a few lines of your own code to the method, prefixes will need to, at the very least, Duplicate all of the code above where you need to patch and to maintain usability of the original method. And in some cases, you will need to duplicate the entire method to add your code into the correct locations. This is time consuming, not only because you need to redo something that has already been done, but also because of the previous reason. Prefixes of this nature are often required to be updated frequently to reflect any changes that are made to the original method. Transpilers, on the other hand, allow you to easily find the exact spot in the method you need, add your new code, and you never need to touch the rest. In most cases, when a change is made to the original method, your transpiler will not be affected, and even if the changes to the method are massive, it is a rather simple matter to just find a new place in the method to put your code in, without having to rewrite anything. They allow multiple patches of the same method without interfering with one another. Since transpilers add or remove code from very specific locations in a method, multiple libraries can have a transpiler patch on the same method. And so long as those patches don't remove code from the original method that another one needs, they will not interfere with each other. On the other hand, if a prefix is re-implementing code from the original method, other prefix patches that do the same can interfere with each other, causing unwanted side effects, such as the same piece of code being executed multiple times. This can be avoided, as there is a way to define what order prefix patches are executed in. However, because of the previous two reasons, it is already highly preferred to use a transpiler. So while this is a minor issue that can be solved, it's just not worth the effort when transpilers already have a clear advantage. Now that I've answered why, let's move on to how. The first thing you will need to know is how to find where to insert your code. Many of you will have noticed Exiled's event transpilers use these funny little offset and index values. But many of you do not know what they are for. Simply put, these allow us to easily identify where in a method our code should be added. So how do you determine this? It's actually fairly straightforward. Just look at the method you wish to patch. For this example, we will be using the weapon manager dot call command reload method from SCP Secret Lab version 10.x. You can see Exiled currently uses a prefix for this event, but I want to make it a transpiler now. So let's go over how I would go about doing this. Hopefully in the process of doing so, I will be able to answer most of your guys' questions about how to make a transpiler. 
Again, this is not a complete guide on how to use patches or transpilers. This is meant to show you how us Exile developers use them for our events. I know there are multiple ways to go about making a transpiler. This is just how we use them here. First, we will need to look at the original method and determine where we should put our patch. So let's open this. And looking around, this line right here, this SCP-268 server disable, looks like a great spot. This way, if our event rejects allowing them to reload, they don't break SCP-268's invisibility for no reason. So to find the index of this line, we will need to find the IL code responsible for this server disable call. Now the method in which you go about viewing the IL of a method can vary. If you have JetBrains Writer, you can simply click IL code above the method and it brings up the IL viewer. There is a plugin for Visual Studio that also does this. However, you can also use DNSpy or ILSpy to do it if neither of these options work for you. So we scroll down a little, right here, we see the IL responsible for making the server disable call. Now we want our code above the line, so let's find the index of the server disable call in our transpiler. Now we have the index for where it actually calls server disable, which is right here. Um, however, we actually want our code to go up here, above where it says LDARG0. Um, that way we are not interfering with the evaluation stack. So now we're going to implement an offset, and we will then apply that offset to our index. Now our offset is negative 2 because normally our code would end up going right here, but we want to go two opcodes up. We want our code to be before this, so negative two. Now that we know where our code will be going, we are going to need a way to return the function in case our ev.isAllowed is set to false by a plugin. There are two ways to do this. The one I prefer and the one we are going to be doing is by defining a new label. Now comes the fun part. We need to actually add our code to add the event. We will do this by adding our code instructions via insert range on our list of code instructions. The first thing we need to do is get a player object for the event, which will require the use of the weapon manager.hub field. So let's do that. This will essentially be player.get underscore hub. First we need to load this.hub into the evaluation stack, which means we first need to load this into the evaluation stack. move labels from is fairly self-explanatory. If there are any labels on the IL call we're putting code in front of, we're going to be moving them up to our first one. This is useful for methods that use go-to labels. LDR0 will always be the class you are working in. In this case, it's the instance of the weapon manager class that is calling the call command reload method. Now we load the player's reference hub onto the stack.
Now that the topmost item on the evaluation stack is the player's reference hub, we can use it to get the player's player object. Now our evaluation stack has only their player object. Since we use this .hub to get it, those values are no longer on the stack. Now for our event, we will also need the animation only bool from the method call. So let's go ahead and load that onto our stack as well. This will load the first argument of the method onto the stack. In our case, it's the animation only bool parameter for the method. Now we have everything to create our reloading event args. For that, we will need to create a new object and define the reloading event args constructor so that it creates the object we need. Now, we've used the reference hub and bool values from our stack and created a new reloading weapon event args object, which has taken their place as the topmost value on our stack. We're going to need to access this twice, once to call the event and again to check if EVE is allowed is true or false. So let's go ahead and duplicate the value on our stack. Now we have two copies of our event args value. Remember, since we created a new object, this value is actually just a reference to the object that we created. We didn't duplicate the actual object, just the reference to it in our evaluation stack. Now we can call our event. Now you'll notice when we do our call here, um, our method on reloading weapon doesn't have any overloads. It, it's just the normal same method. Um, so we don't need to define what parameter types to use. However, up here when we call player.get, it does have overloads. It can accept a game object, a reference hub, etc. So we need to define the parameters that we are going to be using on this method so that it calls the correct overload. Now let's check our EV is allowed value and if it's false we return so the rest of the original method doesn't execute. This loads the value of EV is allowed into our evaluation stack, and BR false checks if that value is false. If it is, it hands off control of the method to the return label that we defined earlier. But we haven't actually added that return label to the method yet, so let's go ahead and add that real quick. This puts our new return label at the very end of the method where it naturally returns. This is going to be opcode ret, as you can see right here. 
So the last things that we need to do are tell the transpiler to actually return our modified code instruction. For that, we will do this. And then we go ahead and return our list of code instruction back to the pool because we are done with it. And there you have it. Hopefully my explanations helped fill in some knowledge gaps and make it easier for you to learn transpilers. I know not everything in this video is explained perfectly, but my goal is to explain it in a way that makes sense to the most people, not to be 100% technically accurate. Keep in mind that transpilers do not work the same as prefixes. A prefix or postfix will run every time the method it patches is called, whereas a transpiler only runs once when the patch is completed, but the changes to the base method will remain. That means you can't do stuff like... You can't do stuff like this, because this will always be false when the transpiler initially patches this method during server startup. If you need to do a check like this in order to change the behavior of your patch, then you are going to need to add that into your, your newly inserted code. This also means that any code you want to add needs to be converted to IL code to be added to the method. You can use a website called sharplab.io to convert C# -sharp into IL so that you can learn what opcodes to use when and where and what they do. And the Harmony lib dependency used by Exiled that is also available on NuGet will give you brief examples of what each opcode does. Or you can go to the Microsoft website to learn more about the opcodes. Links for all of those will be in the description. There's also a tutorial on transpilers by the creator of Harmony on his GitHub, which will also be linked below. Some important things to keep in mind when working with IL directly like this. The evaluation stack must be empty before you return a method. This is why we look for the right place to put our events, and why it is preferred to put them somewhere in the code where the evaluation stack is already empty. If this is not possible, you will need to clear all values from the stack before returning if you do so in your new code, and why it is also very important to make sure to leave the evaluation stack in the same place it was when you started. If there is a string on the stack when you start adding code, you need to ensure that there is still a string on the stack when your code is done unless you are returning the method. Anytime you use a value on the stack for something, be it a method call, setting a local variable, etc., the value gets removed from the stack in the process. This is why the usage of the opcode for duplication comes into play in our little walkthrough and in most of our patches. If you need to use a value on the stack multiple times, you will need to have it on the stack multiple times, or you will need to load it from a local variable or argument each time. It is preferable to just duplicate the value on the stack instead of loading it from a argument or local variable if you'll be using it multiple times in a row like we did earlier in our reloading event. When you are accessing values on the evaluation stack, unless you are using multiple values at once, for example when creating an event args object such as we did earlier, they are handled in a last in first out style meaning the most recent item added to the stack is the first value to be used when performing an evaluation. So if you load an integer and a string into the stack in that order, you can still perform actions with both individually. However, you will need to use the string first as it was the most recent addition to the stack.